Hello everyone, I welcome you all to Physics Fala and in this session we are going to discuss the next portion for a very interesting chapter of organic chemistry which is nothing but the purification as well as estimation of organic compounds. So basically this is the lecture number one of purification of organic compounds and if I talk about the entire part this is related to the first chapter of organic chemistry in class 11th which is simply the purification as well as estimation techniques related to organic compounds. Now I have divided this entire part into two lectures. First part will be the purification techniques. If you have actually created an organic compound, how you are going to purify that particular organic compound so that you can use that particular compound in different type of applications. And basically, this session will be more focused on the introduction part. What, what is the purification and what are the different type of techniques which are used for the purification part. Then we are going to discuss the next portion which is the methods of a purification. That depends upon the type of organic compound as well as its interaction with the solvent as well as different type of systems. Next part will be a very specific term which is known as a chromatography and last part I am going to introduce the qualitative analysis. <clears throat> now if I talk about the first part which is a purification. So first of all you are going to use different type of reactants, the, you are going to mix that entire part in different type of conditions and you are going to produce a particular organic compound. Now that organic compound actually contains some amount of reactant and some amount of reagents which are used to create that organic compound. So definitely certain impurities are present in that particular organic compound. Now whenever you want to use that organic compound for different applications, you want that organic compound should be purified. So in that case we have different type of purification methods to actually clarify all the impurities to remove all the impurities which are already present in the organic compound and generally these imp impurities I can say a certain amount of reactant or certain amount of reagents which are present or a specific amount of catalyst which is used in the reaction part okay. So in that case if I talk about the first part the common techniques which are used for the purification are very easy to understand and most of the technique which you are already know from your 8th, 9th or 10th classes. First one will be the sublimation part, then next one will be the crystallization part, next one will be the distillation in which we are going to discuss about the different concept of distillation, fractional distillation, vacuum distillation, these type of things we are going to discuss. And next part will be the differential extraction and last part a very common technique which is used to purify the organic compound and very small amount of organic compound which is chromatography part okay so let's start with the first discussion if i talk about the first process which is crystallization crystallization can occur in only those processes in which you can actually form the crystal of the organic compound if that crystal formation does not take place you cannot utilize the process of crystallization so the impure compound is actually dissolved in a particular solvent in which it is sparingly soluble at room temperature but appreciably soluble at high temperature because you want to create a super saturated solution. So if you are increasing the temperature definitely the solubility is going to increase. So you have to choose the solvent part according to the properties of the organic compound. Now organic compound can be polar or non-polar. It means its solubility depends upon the type of solvent I am using. The solvent may be polar or non-polar and you know a very simple principle which is known as like dissolves like dissolves like a very interesting principle. It means polar compounds are only soluble in polar solvents and non-polar compounds are soluble in non-polar solvents. So you have to make sure that we are choosing a, a specific type of solvent in which you can see the solubility of the organic compound. Now on cooling the solution, pure compound crystallizes out and it is removed by the filtration. So first of all, whatever impure compound you have, you have to solubilize the entire part in a specific type of solvent. After that, you can just uh, put that organic compound as it is, the solvent is going to remove and eventually the crystals of the organic compound we are going to form, leaving the impurities in the bottom position. Okay, so this is the first part which is a crystallization method. Now in this particular case, if you see the representation is very easy, I have the organic compound, I am going to heat that organic compound in a specific type of reagent which is generally the solvent. After that, I am going to cool down the entire part. I am going to use the filtration because the organic compound is soluble in that solvent. Impurities are not going to be soluble. You can say that impurities 
आर नॉट सॉल्यूबल इन सॉल्वेंट एंड यू हैव क्रिएटेड यू हैव क्रिएटेड अ सेचुरेटेड सॉल्यूशन यू हैव क्रिएटेड अ सेचुरेटेड सॉल्यूशन ऑफ ऑर्गेनिक कंपाउंड इवेंचुअली व्हाट हैपेंस आफ्टर सम टाइम द सॉल्वेंट इज गोइंग टू रिमूव and uh, it's going to form the crystals and that's how you can create pure organic compound i hope the first part is clear to everyone now in the same way there is one more method which is known as recrystallization so it might happen that certain impurities are also going to dissolve in that solvent and they are going to form a particular saturated solution in that case there might be a chance that after cooling the crystals also contain these type of impurities and in that particular situation i have to use the process of recrystallization so what happens in that particular case if the compound is highly soluble in one solvent and very little soluble in another solvent then crystallization can be carried out in the mixture of these solvents so whatever impurities we have there might be a chance that these impurities are soluble in another solvent so if i'm using the mixture some part is going to be soluble in the next solvent and you can separate out the entire part so impurities which impart color to the solution are basically absorbed by absorbing by removed by absorbing the activated charcoal so there are certain impurities which can, which can be easily adsorbed on the activated charcoal and these parts can be easily removed by the filtration method now in this particular case if i talk about the entire process flow you can see that first of all i have the solvent and at a specific temperature definitely then i am going to use the solute which is the organic compound impure organic compound and i am going to make the super saturated solution by increasing the temperature you can see the temperature is increased now i am going to use the another solvent and i am going to mix the entire part in that case you can see mix solvent is going to change its color and eventually whatever impurities are present it's going to be converted into the next solvent part and rest of the solution is going to crystallize to form the original crystal so definitely with the help of recrystallization we can create more purified crystals i hope this first part which is the crystallization as well as recrystallization process is clear to everyone now there are certain organic compounds which can never form any type of crystal definitely i am not going to use the process of crystallization so it depends upon the nature of the organic compound whether it's going to form the crystal or not i hope this part is clear in the same way if i talk about the next method which is sublimation sublimation means you are directly converting solid into gaseous state and vice versa also vice versa so if you are converting solid into gaseous state that process is basically the sublimation if i am converting gaseous part again into solid that is uh, again recomposition or i can say condensation part is there so some solid substances change directly from solid to vapor state without passing through the liquid state and in this case the purification technique based on this behavior or this principle is known as sublimation so which type of organic compound i can choose for the sublimation only those organic compounds which have the capability to convert their form from solid state directly into the gaseous state i hope this entire part is clear i hope this entire part is clear it's a very simple technique very very easy technique okay okay now next part in this particular case i can say it is used to separate sublimate compounds from non sublimate impurities so there should be a difference either the impurities are sublimable or the organic compound is sublimable if any of the thing is going to work with sublimation definitely i can use this process so what happens i have the solid i am going to convert the entire part into the gaseous state so whatever impurities are there they are going to be present in the solid state itself and whatever gases are there i am going to collect those gases i am going to condense the entire part so that i can scratch down the organic compound very easily i hope this entire part is clear i hope this part is clear so this is a basic technique now the property here is either the impurities are sublimable or your organic compound should be sublimable then only i can use this technique now the next part is a distillation very common type of technique which is used for the purification of organic compounds so let's say i have a solvent i have the organic compound and they are mixed together if there is a difference in their boiling point or if the impurity is present along with the organic compound and there is a 
a large difference between their boiling points then i can use the process of distillation so in this particular part i can say volatile liquids from non volatile impurities can be removed volatile means which has the tendency to convert themselves into gaseous state so those are volatile non volatile means they cannot be converted into gaseous state okay or i can use the liquids having a sufficient difference in their boiling point so these two things are there then only i can use the process of distillation now there are different parts of distillation also you have fractional distillation you have a vacuum distillation that depends upon the type of organic compound i'm choosing but first of all if i talk about the distillation let's say i have a particular impurity which is not going to be converted into gaseous state but that particular organ compound has the tendency to convert itself into the gaseous state so if i'm using if i'm heating the entire part before just before its boiling point definitely that organ compound which has the tendency to convert itself into gaseous state can be converted into gaseous state and i can collect the entire part by condensing it with cool water but all the impurities which are non volatile in nature they are going to be remain as it is in the original solution so for example chloroform having boiling point which is a 334 kelvin only and aniline which is a 457 kelvin boiling point both are liquid in nature there is a large difference in their boiling point so i can definitely use the technique which is known as distillation so i just need to heat the entire part in this boiling point because it is lower part definitely the entire part of chloroform can be easily separated from the aniline with the help of the process of distillation i hope this entire part is clear okay in the same way if i talk about the liquid mixture the liquid mixture is taken in a round bottom flask which is a particular apparatus and heated carefully now you need to make sure that on boiling the vapors of lo lower boiling component are formed first because i am using the temperature i am using the temperature which is less than the boiling point i am using the entire part less than the boiling point of lower boiling component and eventually you can see on boiling the vapors of the lower boiling component they are going to be formed first because it's going to reach the boiling point of that lower component first so you can collect that entire part separately and you can differentiate you can easily separate these two mixtures so generally if we have two liquids and there is a large difference in their boiling point then i can use this particular technique now the vapors are condensed by using a condenser and the liquid is collected in a receiver flask and the vapors of the higher boiling component form later and the liquid can be collected separately because we know there is a large difference in their boiling point so this is the description of the entire analysis of distillation i hope up to that part everything is clear to everyone so this entire portion is slightly theoretical so just try to understand what is happening in each case okay okay now <clears throat> if i talk about the setup i'm starting with the round bottom flask which contains the mixture and this is the bunsen burner which is going to heat the entire part now i need to make sure that the heat should be lower than the boiling point of lower component or it should be equal to the boiling point of the lower component only first of all vapors are going to form of lower component it's going to pass down through the condenser and it has water flow okay now eventually <clears throat> it's going to condense vapors are going to condense and you can collect the liquid in the receiving flask i hope this part this first portion is clear to everyone second part the technique which we are going to use is basically the fractional distillation it is again the extension part of distillation but in this particular case when the difference of boiling point of two component is actually very small generally it is less than 25 degrees celsius if it is less than 25 degrees celsius then it is required to use the fractional distillation because the difference between between their boiling point is actually very less so when you are heating the component both the components are going to create their vapors and eventually both are going to be collected so again you are creating another mixture 
So in that case, I'm going to use the part of a fractional distillation. So it is nothing but distillation in multiple batches. I'm connecting one distillation unit with second distillation unit, then third distillation unit and so on. So that if you're using multiple distillation part, eventually the component which is a lower boiling is going to be volatile first after multiple batches and you are going to collect that part into the separate uh, receiver flask. Now, the difference between these two parts is I am going to use a separate type of a different type of a chamber which has multiple batches. That part is related to the fractional distillation. In this particular case, I can say that this technique, in this technique, vapors of a liquid mixture are actually pa uh, passed through a fractionating column. That column which I was talking about, a separate type of system which is known as fractionating column before condensation. Fractionating column contains a different type of condensation parts, different type of fractional batches and eventually after multiple batches, the component having lower boiling point is going to be collected first. So you can see the vapors rising up in the fractionating column become richer more and more in the volatile component first, which is a very important point, which is a very important point. Now you can say, you can say a fractionating column is of various sizes and design that depends upon the type which you are choosing for the distillation part. A fractionating column provides many surfaces for heat exchange between the ascending vapors and descending condensed liquid. So it is nothing but a distillation in multiple batches. Just try to remember that particular part. It is nothing but the distillation in multiple batches. So if you want to look at the picture of the uh, fractionating column, again, you can find there are multiple columns there so that at every step, uh, different type of distillations are going to occur and eventually you are going to get the vapors which are rich in the lower volatile component or lower boiling component. Okay, the vapors of the low boiling component ascend to the top of the column first definitely. On reaching to the top, the vapors become pure in low boiling component and actually pass through the condenser. That is a simple process and the pure liquid is collected in the receiver. I hope this entire part is clear. So by simply understanding the theory, you will get to know what is going to happen in different type of purification techniques. Now, if I talk about the fractionating column, you can see there are two different types. Either you can uh, use a simple packed column. Again, these are pro these glass beads are going to provide multiple stages for the uh, distillation, you can say. And in this particular case, if I'm using bubble plate column, each plate is going to provide a surface for different type of distillations. So it's going to occur in batches. So if I talk about the entire analysis, you can say that each successive condensation and vaporization unit in the fractionating column is actually known as a theoretical plate. So whatever fractionating columns are, they are different. They are actually known as theoretical plate. And what happens? On the, uh, on the technological applications of fractional distillation is to separate different fraction of crude oil in petroleum industry. Because we know these components are very close to each other. There might be a chance that we have a methane, uh, ethane, butane, propane, these are present. We have the formation of different type of LPGs. They are the, there might be a chance we have diesel and petrol. So their properties are almost, almost similar. So how to differentiate? We can easily use fractional distillation to separate these components. I hope the entire part is clear to everyone. So by simply looking at the theory, you get to know what's going to happen in that particular process. Okay. So this is the entire setup of the fractional distillation. So we have the round bottom plus, but again, this entire part is connected with the fractionating uh, column, which has a different theoretical plates. And each plate is going to provide a surface for separate type of distillation. And eventually the vapors, which are of a low boiling liquid are going to come first and you can condense the entire part in the receiving flask. I hope this entire portion is clear. So this is all about the analysis of uh, fractional distillation. Okay, just have a look at it. <clears throat> okay, now if I talk about the next part, steam distillation. Again, it's a process of distillation, but instead of using the temperature, direct temperature, now I'm using high temperature steam for the distillation part. So this technique is applied to separate substances which are actually steam volatile in nature. 
सो दे आर नॉट जनरली वॉलेटाइल बट दे आर स्टीम वॉलेटाइल इन नेचर एंड जनरली दे आर इमिसिबल विद वॉटर वॉट इज द मीनिंग दैट इमिसिबल इन वॉटर दे आर नॉट गोइंग टू मिक्स विद वॉटर वॉटर वॉट एवर स्टीम्स आर प्रेजेंट दे आर गोइंग टू ओनली इनिशिएट देअर वेपराइजेशन so that they can convert into gaseous state and they can be collected separately because they are not going to mix with water at all separate layers are going to be formed uh, just like that if you if you add oil with water eventually you know that they are not going to mix together if you shake the entire um, bottle with oil and water you can see after some time the oil is going to settle down and water is going to come on the upper side if the density of water is less in comparison to the oil so you can see a separation between these two parts so if the component is uh, water immiscible and it is steam volatile in nature then you can use the technique which is steam distillation what happens in steam distillation steam from a steam generator or a source is passed through the heated flask containing the liquid to be distilled so the, that flask is already heated but eventually when the steam is going to pass through that particular part whatever component which is steam volatile is going to interact with the steam and eventually it's going to go with the steam part okay now the mixture of the steam and the volatile organic compound is condensed again uh, and it is collected now because they are immiscible in nature they are not going to mix at all and eventually you can see that we can easily separate these two parts from the separating funnel separating funnel is a special type of funnel where you can mix two liquids which are not immiscible with not miscible with each other and they are going to form different layers so first of all the more dense layer will be present on the bottom position the less dense layer will be on the upper side so you can open that separating funnel column and you can collect the liquid and eventually you can again uh, remove the next part which may be steam or which may be water i hope the entire part is clear so this is the entire analysis about the steam distillation okay now in steam distillation the liquid boils when the sum of the vapor pressure due to organic liquid and that due to water becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure because if you know the concept of uh, vaporization you know the concept of vapor pressure we generally say that any type of liquid is going to boil when its boiling point <clears throat> or when its vapor pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure then i can say we are talking about the normal boiling point that is the concept which is generally used in case of physical chemistry again i am repeating that uh, entire statement if i want to know about the normal boiling point of a particular liquid i need to make sure that i am heating the liquid at a particular temperature where its vapor pressure actually becomes equal to the vapor pressure by the atmosphere which is generally 1 atm when these two pressures are going to correlate definitely the liquid is going to boil but in this case i am using water also so i can say that when p atmosphere when p atmosphere becomes equal to the p of organic compound vapor pressure of organic compound as well as vapor pressure of steam then only you can see that this organic compound is going to volatile it's going to create its vapors okay so in this particular case always remember that the liquid which contains the organic compound is going to boil when the sum of the pressures due to organic compound first part and second part water becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure this is the most 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 important condition related to the steam distillation so you can simply say that whatever organic compound i am choosing the vapor pressure due to this organic compound is always less than atmospheric vapor pressure it should be always less than atmospheric vapor pressure i hope this entire part is clear just note down this important thing now if i talk about the next process we have another term which is known as vacuum distillation vacuum distillation means you have to create first of all vacuum vacuum means very very low pressure so basically this is nothing but the distillation under reduced pressure what happens in this case this method is generally used to purify liquids having very high boiling point because you cannot provide that much amount of energy to reach to their boiling point 
so in that case what i have to do i just have to reduce the pressure uh, you can correlate with that example that generally the the if you want to prepare maggi in in our region in north region i can say and if you want to create the maggi in himalayas and all the mountains there might be a difference in the boiling at the, if you if you reach to the height definitely pressure is going to change and which changes the boiling point which changes the boiling point which changes the entire part of uh, boiling in that particular case so what you have to do if you have very high boiling point you just have to reduce the pressure if the pressure is reduced definitely less temperature will be required to reach or to equate the vapor pressure to the atmospheric pressure because atmospheric pressure is already reduced so that's why at a normal temperature you can create that type of situation i hope this this analogy clears to you so you can say this method is used to purify the liquids having very high boiling points and those which decompose at or below their boiling point. So two things are there. First one, the compounds which are having very high boiling point and all those compounds which have the tendency to decompose below or at their boiling points. In those cases, I can use the process of distillation by just lowering down the pressure. Now, such liquids are made to boil at a temperature lower than their normal boiling points by reducing the pressure on their surface. Normal boiling point means that the temperature where the vapor pressure of that liquid becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure. Now, the atmospheric pressure is already reduced. So, definitely less temperature will be required to boil them. Okay. I hope this entire part is clear. I hope this entire part is clear. Okay. In the same way, if I talk about the process, a liquid boils at a temperature at which its vapor pressure becomes equal to the external pressure. That part we already know, a simple process of boiling. Now, the pressure is reduced with the help of a water pump or you can say a vacuum pump. Vacuum pump is going to reduce the pressure drastically. What happens if I talk about the glycerol? Glycerol can be separated from spent lye in the soap industry by using this type of technique. It's a very important application related to the vacuum distillation because there might be a chance that first of all the temperature required will be more and it has the tendency to decompose so it's better to use the process of vacuum distillation i hope the entire part is clear to everyone so it's all about the theory if you understand the theory all the questions are going to be from theory itself you will be able to answer those questions very very easily trust me okay and every every time you can find at least one question related to these purification techniques okay if i talk about the differential extraction in that case i can say that uh, uh, when an organic compound is present in aqueous medium it is separated by shaking it with organic solvent in which it is more soluble in comparison to water so differential extraction is a very interesting technique we know that most of the organic compound most of the organic compounds they are non-polar in nature they are non-polar in nature and if i talk about the water definitely we know that water is polar if i am using another solvent if i am using another solvent which is organic in nature which is organic solvent then you know the principle which is going to work. The principle is like dissolves like this principle is going to work. Organic compounds are going to be more soluble in organic solvents and eventually they can reach out to that solvent and they are going to mix with organic solvent. So you just have to shake the entire part. The organic compound is going to be transferred into the organic solvent and eventually organic solvent and water, they are not going to mix together with each other that efficiently if the organic solvent is also non-polar, if that solvent is also non-polar. And you can easily separate the entire part. I hope this portion is clear. This is the simple technique of differential extraction. So the organic solvent and the aqueous solution should be immiscible. And uh, in that case, they form two distinct layer, which can be separated by the separating funnel. I hope this part is clear. It's like mixing oil with water, just like that, just like that. Okay. So the organic solvent is later removed by distillation or by evaporation to get back to the organic compound. So let's say this is the original solution. 
you can see the solvent layer is this organic compound is present in the aqua solution you just have to mix it together and you can see the color change because now the organic compound is transferred to the upper solvent layer which is the organic solvent and water is there so you just have to open this lid you can remove the water or aqueous layer and after that you can remove the organic compound you have to use the process of distillation because organic solvents are very very volatile in nature so they can easily removed and eventually you will get your organic compound i hope this entire portion is clear this is the entire process about the distillation so we have discussed about the sublimation we have discussed about the process of crystallization we have discussed about the process of distillation uh, as well as if i talk about the next part which is fractional distillation we have discussed about the differential extraction part we have discussed about the vacuum distillation and we have discussed about the steam distillation so these are certain techniques which are related to the uh, purification of organic compounds and each type of technique is useful for a very specific set of organic compounds which are similar to those properties which can be utilized in these processes i hope this entire part is clear i hope this entire part is clear just have a look at it okay now if i talk about the next part of chromatography it's a very interesting technique the main advantage of this technique over all the other techniques is you can actually separate a very small amount of organic compound with the help of chromatography so basically chromatography is an important technique extensively used in to separate mixtures into their components purify the components and also to test the purity of the compounds and generally this part was actually initially started to separate the colors which are uh, present in the in the pigments of uh, plants we can say or you can utilize the entire part to check the colors which are present in the black ink or blue ink so that was the initial step but nowadays this technique which is chromatography is extensively used in the organic labs to separate different type of organic compounds which are very very similar to each other it is used to purify the compounds and it is used to test the purity of the organic compound okay so it's the most important technique i can say it's the most important technique now what happens in that particular case so according to the iupac chromatography is a physical method of separation in which the components to be separated are distributed between two phases so generally we use two phases first one is the stationary phase next one is the mobile phase now <clears throat> one of them is stationary when other move in a specific direction so we have two phases first one is stationary phase and next one will be the mobile phase definitely this mobile phase is going to be a particular liquid or gas and this entire part of stationary phase it must be either liquid and generally it is solid so generally we use stationary phase as a solid and mobile phase as liquid i hope this part is clear i hope this part is clear okay now what happens in that particular case you can say mobile phase is basically the fluid in which the mixture to be separated is dissolved is known as mobile phase so it's going to move it's going to move above or along with the stationary phase stationary phase is basically phase over which the mobile phase is passed okay so these two phases are very very important when you talk about the entire process of chromatography okay and there are different type of techniques either i can use paper chromatography or i can use column chromatography that depends upon the principle on which these processes are going to work okay so first of all in this technique the mixtures of substances is applied onto a stationary phase generally these stationary phase can be alumina or silica al2o3 or sio2 that depends upon their sizes but generally these stationary phases are basically uh, solid or liquid if i talk about solid only if i talk about solid only then you can say the most important one is silica and alumina sio2 or you can say al2o3 okay 
Now a pure solvent or a mixture of solvent or a gas is allowed to move slowly over the stationary phase. Now, just try to understand what is going to happen. So first of all, the initial stage of the race. So there is a race which is going to occur. Initial stage of the race is we have a stationary phase. On the top of the stationary phase, we have organic components. Now I am going to use the part which is mobile phase. Now if that component like I'm using the organic compound and it has multiple mixtures. It has multiple components. If one component has more affinity with the mobile phase, it's going to go, it's going to move with the organic phase or whatever solvent I'm using. If that particular mixture has a component which has a very less interaction with the solvent, it's going to stand there only. I'm not going to move at all. I'm not going to move. So by that process, you can actually separate the mixtures. The mixture which is going to come forward with the stationary uh, with the mobile phase has more interaction with the mobile phase and the the component which is going to be stationary at the initial position has very less interaction with the mobile phase and that's how you can separate these components i hope this part is clear so in that particular case you need to select the stationary phase you need to select the mobile phase it may be a simple type of solvent or it may be a mixture of solvent that depends upon the complexity of the organic compound whether we have two, three components or we have multiple components. Okay. I hope this part is clear. Now, the components of the analyte, whatever organic compound I'm using, interact differently with these two phases. And depending upon their polarity, they spend less or more time interacting with the stationary phase and thus they are going to be retarded to a greater or lesser extent. If they have very much interaction with the stationary phase, they are going to move very slowly, very slowly, just like your turtle. If they have more interaction with the uh, mobile phase and very less interaction with the stationary phase, they are going to move like rabbit in the race. I hope this entire part is clear. I hope this portion is clear. So it's a very simple theory which is related to the chromatography. Okay. Now further about the chromatographic separation, we can say this leads to the separation of different components which are present in the sample because every, every uh, compound which is present in the mixture, it's going to be moved with different speed because it has different type of interactions with mobile as well as stationary phase. And each sample component eludes from the stationary phase at a specific time, which is actually known as retention time. So if if a particular mixture has two, three components and the component which is going to move very fast, its retention time is going to be very, very less. If a component is moving very slowly, very slowly, its retention time is going to be very, very high. I hope this entire part is clear. Okay. Now, based on the principle involved in the chromatography, you can categorize it depending upon the two parts. First one will be the adsorption chromatography and next one will be the partition chromatography next one will be the partition chromatography okay and there are different types of these two do two analysis so adsorption chromatography actually works on the principle of adsorption that i am using a particular stationary phase and the organic component is going to adsorb on the surface of that particular stationary phase so that is the adsorption chromatography first part which is adsorption chromatography and in that case the main part is column chromatography the most important technique which is generally nowadays used in every type of organic lab is basically your column chromatography okay now adsorption chromatography is based on the fact that different components or different compounds are adsorbed on the adsorbent to different degrees that adsorbent is generally your stationary phase okay commonly used adsorbent i already told you is basically silica gel as well as alumina so if you visit any organic chemistry lab you can find the column which is already packed with these parts alumina or silica okay now what happens in this process when a mobile phase is allowed to move over a stationary phase which is generally the adsorbent the components of the mixture move by varying distance over the stationary phase. And two important parts are basically your column chromatography and TLC. TLC is a thin layer chromatography. I hope this part is clear. I hope this part is clear. Now, you can say that column chromatography 
actually involves a mixture over a column of adsorbent which is a stationary phase packed in a glass tube then the column is fitted with a stop cock at the lower end i'm going to like show you what is going to happen in case of column chromatography it's a very simple setup very easy setup okay now the next important point is the mixture adsorbed on the adsorbent is placed on the top of the adsorbent column in the glass tube what happens an appropriate elutent it may be a simple solvent or it may be a mixture is going to allow to flow through that particular uh, system which is already packed with your adsorbent as well as your upper side of organic mixture and then this column is going to run very very slowly and eventually depending upon their interaction or force of attraction with the uh, adsorbent or with mobile phase they are going to move at different speeds and eventually you can see that different components are going to be separated very easily okay i hope this part is clear i hope this entire part is clear so it's all about to understand the basic theory of uh, chromatography what happens depending upon the degree to which the compounds are adsorbed complete separation actually takes place that's why only with the help of this technique only you can actually purify entire organic compounds very easily very easily now the most readily absorbed substances are retained near the top because they have a more interaction with the stationary phase and others come down the various speeds or various distances depending upon their interaction so if a component in the mixture has more interaction with the stationary phase it's going to be move very slowly but if the component which has very less interaction it's going to move very fast okay now you can see this is the stages these are the stages for separation so let's say let's say in the in this this part in this part you can see there is adsorbent which is the packed column on the above portion i have the mixture along with the adsorbent so you can see there are three components but i can see only one color and now on the top side i am using the solvent definitely solvent is going to run down and eventually it can separate these components now <clears throat> you can see that after some time after some time you will reach to the stage you will reach to the stage like this now you can see two different colors it means b and c has more interaction with the solvent but a has more interaction with the adsorbent part after some time you can see that both a b and c they are going to be separated now by simply looking at the uh, this this diagram you can say that a has more interaction a has more interaction with stationary phase on the other hand c has more interaction with mobile phase and that's how you can separate these mixtures very easily this is the very basic part of your column chromatography i hope this entire portion is clear now if i talk about the partition chromatography partition chromatography is actually based on the continuous differential partitioning of components of a mixture between stationary and mobile phase and generally it's a very simple technique which we like which we teach generally students of 8th or 9th class to separate different components of ink so you just need like the classic example of this entire part is paper chromatography so that is a very common example related to this entire part you can see this is the uh, analysis of paper chromatography so a special quality paper which is generally known as chromatography paper you all must have used this type of paper this paper is used and chromatography paper contains a uh, contains water trapped in it which acts as a stationary phase so what happens you just have to like cut down a small amount of chromatography paper and like above 2.5 cm generally you have to like um, use a very small capillary and you have to drop down whatever component you are using it may be a ink it may be a complex uh, component which are present and you have to dip the entire part in the limited amount of solvent just because of the capillary action this solvent is going to move upward and eventually if these components have more or less interaction with the solvent they are going to move at different speeds so after that you can see that a strip of chromatography paper is spotted at the base generally 2.5 cm above the the lower portion 
ओके एंड विद द सॉल्यूशन ऑफ द मिक्सचर इज सस्पेंडेड इन द सुटेबल सॉल्वेंट और अ मिक्सचर ऑफ सॉल्वेंट सो इन दिस केस द एंटायर प्रोसेस इज गोइंग अपवर्ड जस्ट बिकॉज ऑफ द कैपिलरी एक्शन सो दिस सॉल्वेंट एक्ट एज अ मोबाइल फेस एंड द पेपर स्ट्रिप सो डेवलप्ड इज नोन एज क्रोमेटोग्राम सो दिस इज अ वेरी कॉमन एक्सपेरिमेंट विच जनरली यूज टू सेपरेट डिफरेंट कलर्स ऑफ ब्लैक इंक you must have like used that entire chromatography process in your schools also so you know this process which is a paper chromatography now what happens in this particular case you can see after some time you can see different stops uh, spots are moving in different uh, speeds and with the help of this starting position i can say that which component is moving very slowly and which component is going to move very very fast that is the basic analysis of your chromatography and that's how we can complete the entire part related to the purification of organic compounds okay so this session was all about the theoretical aspect now i can suggest you to practice at least 15 to 20 questions related to the uh, processes whatever we have discussed in this particular session the questions are going to be very very straightforward you just have to pick that method which is suitable Uh, with respect to the organic compound so if the properties are going to match with the organic compound definitely you can use different methods either the sublimation or crystallization or recrystallization or dist uh, distillation or fractional distillation or steam distillation vacuum distillation differential extraction or chromatography i hope everyone enjoyed this session learned something new from this session remaining part of a qualitative as well as quantitative analysis will be covered in the next session okay so that's all from my side thank you so much